Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar. My name is Andrew Townsend, I'm with eLearning Brothers. Today our session will be about common concerns and hiccups that come into projects and what we at eLearning Brothers have done to combat them. Uh, this session will be recorded, we'll get a copy of it sent out to everyone who has registered for this session. Uh, we'll get that emailed out later in the day. If you have questions or comments during the session and you'd like to participate, participate, please use the questions panel. It looks like some of you have already found that questions panel. And, wow. uh, and so please do use that and, and comment. All right, so we have Laura Durr, Senior and Lead Project Manager on our custom team with us today to talk to us about uh, some of these challenges and how we've overcome them. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you, Laura. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Hello, everybody. Again, my name is Laura Durham, the Senior and Lead Project Manager at eLearning Brothers. What that means is I manage the project managers that manage your projects. That's a mouthful, right? <laughs> but one of the things we talk about a lot is customer delight, how our communication delights people. Um, and one item that we recently hit on is learning from our mistakes. It's so important to do that. We oftentimes will just move on, get past those mistakes and forget about them and we don't learn from them. And we wanna learn from them. And in today's webinar, we're gonna hit on some of those, hit on those mistakes that we've made in the past, especially those ones that repeat over and over that we keep trying to see. If we can minimize all those hiccups and those problems that come into our projects, we can decrease, or I should say increase, the likelihood of having some customer delight in all of our projects. So let's get going. So on this slide, you're gonna see a bunch of logos, and these are some of the companies that we've had the pleasure of working with the past many several years at eLearning Brothers. Um, and you're gonna notice when you look at this, there's a lot of different companies on here, a lot of different industries. Um, when I look at it, I'm staring at it right now, I see, um, I see food, I see technology, entertainment, um, gas and electric, financial, consumer products. I see a bunch of different uh, diverse industries on this page. Now, depending on who you are and the role that you play in your company, if this slide belonged to you, it might look a little bit like this slide with some logos, or your slide might look a little bit like this. So your clients might be Marianne and Human Resources or Jose and Operations, Michelle and R&D. At eLearning Brothers, we have learned in our experience that regardless if you're working with a $1 billion consumer products company or if you're working with Bob in accounting, the problems and the hiccups and the concerns still seem to be the same thing. They seem to happen no matter what the company size, no matter what the industry is. It just seems to be, it was, it was seeming a little bit repetitive. Um, so what I would like to do, Andrew, if you could help me here, I had a quick poll and I'm very curious to see the answer to this, but I would love to know when each of you out there thinks about the challenges that you face every day when you are developing your training, are those challenges unique, meaning every day is something brand new, or do you tend to get a lot of common challenges? Is it the same thing over and over and over again? Um, so Andrew, if we could throw that up on the screen, I don't see it, but maybe it's yeah, up there. That, that polls up on the screen. You guys can click directly on the screen. Go ahead and just select unique or common. And it looks like a good portion of you have already uh, commented here and made note. I will give you just a few more seconds to tally in. There's definitely a clear winner here. Uh, I'll go ahead and close that and oh, no. here's those results. 84% so of our audience selected common and 60% selected unique. Okay, that is kind of what I thought would happen. Thank you guys for participating in that poll, that, that's great. So that is exactly what we found at eLearning Brothers. It tended to be the same thing over and over and over again when facing these projects. Um, so let me give you an example of one of the common things that we were facing. So here's the scenario. It's taking you days to pull everybody together to kick off this project. You finally get them all together in the room or everybody's on the phone. It took a PhD in calendar management to make this happen. You dotted all your I's, you crossed all your T's, you're five minutes into the kickoff call or into the meeting 
and whoops, we don't have what we need to get going. Showstopper. Or maybe you get five minutes into the call and you realize that we thought we were building ABC and this side of the room thought we were building XYZ, completely different expectations. We on the project management team at eLearning Brothers, we call that the big letdown. <laughs> the call just immediately goes south. Um, the timelines that you worked so hard to build, they're busted, they're gone. <laughs> the team that you blocked out to work on this project, well, they're not gonna be working on this project right now. Um, even worse, have you ever been on one of those calls when your stakeholders are on the call? You want to look good in front of them. You want to impress them. And they witnessed firsthand that big roadblock that just happened. And nobody wants that to happen. So we saw that happening fairly often, not all the time, but a good amount of the time. And we realized not only is this incredibly inefficient, it is a huge demoralizer. It is it's just demoralizing to the team. It was demoralizing for us and for our clients. Um, we realized that the upfront conversations that we were having in our kickoff calls or even before the kickoff calls with the sales reps when we were trying to sell projects, we weren't minimizing the risk of this happening. No matter how hard we tried, we were still having this happen, even in a kickoff call or even later on down the road in the middle of a project. So this led us to this big aha moment where we said we need to do something about it. We can't prevent every problem. It's going to happen. But we see the same ones happening over and over and over again. Let's figure out a way where we can try to minimize the risk of those happening all the time. So that led us to the next slide here, which is the readiness phase. Um, we have a pretty solid project process at ELB. We know how to do e-learning. We can crank it out fast. We can crank it out really good. Um, but one thing that we never had was this readiness phase. And we decided, you know what? We want to add this to our process. So let me tell you a little bit about what readiness is. So what is readiness? Readiness is a pre-kickoff discussion. And I'm going to emphasize the word pre Kickoff, pre, 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 it's before kickoff. And the objective is to gauge our readiness for starting a project. Um, we will talk about all the project details. And we're also going to discuss all these common concerns, problems, and issues that creep their way into projects. We didn't think it was good enough to only talk about them when they happen. We want to talk about them in advance so we can prevent them from happening. Who gets readiness? Well, at eLearning Brothers, we will give this readiness call and discussion to all of our brand new clients. So I will put a disclaimer on there that if you come to us with this really tiny, tiny, tiny little project and we crank it out in a week and a half, we probably won't do readiness. Um, but beyond that, yes, we will do readiness for all brand new clients. We also have repeat clients that if they ask for it, We'll do it again. We have heard clients say, you know what, that was so good for me. I want to do that again. Can we have that call? Absolutely. Or we might have a repeat client who has a new stakeholder or a new coworker who's never done this before. And I would, you know, they might say, I'd really like for her to sit in and listen to what you guys have to say. So we'll give this read, we'll do this readiness call with anybody, but we'll definitely offer it up for all brand new clients to ELB. So you might be asking yourself, is readiness the same thing as kickoff? Is, why are we doing this twice? It actually is not the same thing. Um, if you think about it, kickoff is not the meeting to prepare to do the project. Kickoff is the meeting to start the project. Readiness is to prepare and to make sure that we are go to for launch. Thumbs up, ready to go. Yes, we can start this project. How does the client prepare for readiness? Actually, they don't do anything but come to the call. Um, I tell them, I just need you to show up, bring whoever you want to bring. I will come prepared with an agenda and I will walk you through that agenda and I will facilitate the conversations. Um, I want to talk to them about you know, potential issues and let's address them, let's strategize together, talk about it before it happens. And then how long is readiness? Well, when we have readiness, it can we usually just schedule an hour and it is the most valuable hour you could ever imagine. <laughs> but it's usually about an hour. There are some clients that get through it quicker. Um, and then there are some clients where we go a little bit long because they have discovered we bring up some things they've never thought of before. They want to hear our recommendations for how they can handle certain things. And it goes a little bit longer. Um, what's important about that, though, is that I always tell our clients at the beginning of a readiness call that I want them to set the pace for the call. 
So as I walk them through this conversation and through this agenda, if they want to stop and talk about anything in more detail, we will do it. Just tell me. If they have questions, tell me, ask me. If they want to just knock it out and go through it, bam, 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 that's totally fine too. I want them to set the pace and we will move forward as they're comfortable with moving forward. So what I thought we could do now and for the remainder of the time that we have is take everyone here on the line through their own readiness phase. Um, I want to walk through each one of the agenda items that we go through and then I'll share with you the questions that I ask in underneath those agenda items and keeping in mind that these questions were crafted based on our experience to know all the hiccups, all the problems and concerns that happen repeatedly. So we weave those questions in so we can address those as we move through the call. So the first thing we talk about on uh, readiness is roles and responsibilities. Believe it or not, this is a huge project timeline and budget buster. It can be if we don't get it right. Um, it used to be many moons ago that roles and responsibilities was just taking 15 minutes up front on a call and everybody went around the room and they said their name and they gave a little bio of themselves that no one will remember. And then we felt like that was okay to move forward because we, we've met everybody, it's a meet and greet. That just isn't good enough anymore. Um, so let me ask, let me show you some of the questions that we asked to drill down deeper into roles and responsibilities. Number one, who is the main point of contact? We have had projects in the past where clients have struggled with that, where they have multiple people on their team answering emails, giving conflicting information, and it just it's just not efficient and it creates a lot of confusion. So I'm very clear in asking them, I need to know who is your main point of contact that we will talk to and speak with every day. Who should be on correspondence? That is different than the main point of contact. Who needs to be on all the emails? Sometimes they'll say, just me, I'll forward it on, that's great. Or sometimes they'll give other names, but we wanna be really, really clear. Okay, if we include these three individuals on correspondence, we're good. You're not gonna think that we've left somebody out or we didn't communicate properly. Who's the decision maker? That's a big one. Oftentimes, you don't even see the decision maker. They are the person behind the curtain that you don't see the name or the face, um, but they're in the background making decisions. It's good to know that the person who is looking at this might be the person who's different than the one that you're talking to day in and day out. This one right here is huge. Who may provide approvals? I can tell you countless stories, one in particular of a company that we worked with maybe five or six years ago, where we had an individual, our main point of contact, who was approving deliverables. It was a large multi-module project, and she was approving work, and we were moving along and cranking along, and it wasn't till the very end where they had someone on their side step in and say, well, she can't provide you those approvals. That should have come from me. That was a deal break. It was a showstopper because we had done all this work only to find out that we had to go back now and redo it all. And that really impacted our client's timeline and their budget. What's so sad about that is that, you know, it, it was an issue on their end. It was no fault of ours, but they still walked away with not having a good, delightful experience. When they think back of working with us, that's what they thought about and it wasn't good. So we want every touch point and every interna interaction to be positive. Um, it's really super important to remember that the main point of contact, the decision maker and who may provide approvals can oftentimes be three separate individuals. So make sure on your projects that you are really, really clear on those roles and make sure it's very, very clear who is allowed to give approvals. Also on readiness, I will ask, have you identified your stakeholders and your subject matter experts? You would be very, very shocked to know that we are days from starting projects where clients say, no, I haven't really, not yet. Or they'll say, yes, I know who my stakeholders are and who my subject matter experts are. And I'll say, that's great. Have you told them that this project's starting? Yeah, not yet. Haven't really gotten around to talking to them yet. Yikes, I can give you some stories. 
about how that can be a problem. So I like to educate our clients, give them some little background on why it's so important to let's get them engaged and involved right now. Um, the other part about it is, is when you talk about your stakeholders, there are stakeholders that don't want to be involved at the very beginning. They want to be involved at the very, very end. And while that's risky, because they might come in and change things, it is what it is, right? So we need to plan for that. So that's when I can have a conversation with the client to say, okay, if your stakeholders don't want to look at a storyboard, they don't want to look at, at anything until it's completely done, I want to let you know what the risk of that is and what that might do. And let's talk about it and, and try to plan for that. Um, so they can educate their people. And then if the stakeholder does come in at the very end and change everything, we can say, yeah, we knew this might happen. Here's the plan for what we're going to do to work on that. This next one is one of my favorite questions that we ask under roles and responsibilities uh, during readiness. And I always we always ask for every single project that we do is marketing and or legal involved in your project if we have any marketing or legal folks on the call today we love you we think you're awesome um, but these groups to their maybe no fault of their own have notoriously been some groups that come in at the very very end of projects and throw up some showstoppers um, you may be days away from having your project complete and you've worked on it hard for many, many, many weeks and you hear from legal that you can't put the course out there because they haven't reviewed and approved the text. Or you hear from marketing that the logo is changing and we can't use the shade of green that we used within the course and all the fonts need to be changed. We don't want that to happen. So if someone answers yes to this question, yeah, marketing will legal and be involved, I take a minute and I stop and I share with them what that means. We need to get them involved early on. This is the places where we need to get them involved and we need to give them a chance to have their input before we're almost finished with the project. So before you move on, Laura, there's a quick question here. Um, sure. Who decides on who may give approvals and what's the difference between a stakeholder and the other roles? Because as you have a, a, a customer, it kind of feels like they're all stakeholders in one way or another. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the first part of it you said was, can you repeat the first part? What the, yeah, who, um, who, may provide? who can give approvals? Yeah, that is totally 100% up to the client. So if the client says to me, Lisa can give me approvals, I will clearly say back to them, okay, so you're telling me that if Lisa sends me an email or gives me a phone call and says that this is approved, I am good to go. I don't need to worry about maybe four or five other people that I don't know about or I need to wonder or I have to reply back and say, thanks, Lisa, for that approval. Anybody else? I know if Lisa says it, it's good to go. So really the client needs to make that decision. And oftentimes, I can't tell you how many times the, the conversation starts and, and they're not clear on it. And they're really, really glad that we asked. And it helps them kind of Get, get their act together and get their structure together. I think the next question was about stakeholders. Yep. How do you um, differentiate a stakeholder from the other roles? Yeah. So in this regard, we're talking about um, the main point of contact, the person on correspondence, the decision maker. Oftentimes, you know, they might be involved in the project. We have found often that there are stakeholders or groups that are kind of in the background. And they're the people that say, I have a stake in this. It really is important to me that this course turns out right. But they're not in that day to day. So it's the people that may not be in the day to day, but they still they still want to see it. They still want to be a part of it. They still want to make sure that their part, what's important to them, is covered. So stakeholders in this regard is kind of that group of people that maybe is, like I said, behind the curtain. And we just want to check with the client and say, hey, anybody else, anybody else that we need to know about that we want to make sure they're involved and when and where can we get them involved? I hope that answered that question. Yeah, I think it does. We've got one more question, and this might uh, help propel us forward. Um, okay. But do you, do you run into issues with naming conventions? For example, I've found that what the client thinks is training or animation is different from what I define as training or animation. Yes, yes. And you know what? That is a great segue for what's going to be coming up next. So that's a really great question. Um, can I hit on that on the next on the next piece? Yep, that works great. Thanks. Awesome.
yeah, I will get to that. So to conclude roles and responsibilities really quick, the last thing we always want to ask, are there any decisions that need to be made before we start designing and building? We can be given content that the client says up and down, sideways, left and right, that it is final. We'll get going with it, we'll move forward with it, we'll build with it, only to find out, yeah, that section in module three, actually those screenshots need to be, um, they're getting all changed. Yikes, if we would have known that from the very beginning, I would have avoided module three to the very end. And then I wouldn't have to rework it for you. So that's a really important decision, um, a really important question to ask, just to make sure, hey, is there anything looming out there that you know of that maybe we should avoid or stay away from for a little while while um, it gets approved? Okay, so we're gonna get to that uh, animation question. I think it's on the next slide, but we are gonna get there. Um, the second agenda piece that we like to talk about is defining success criteria. This is probably the shortest section of our discussion on readiness, but it brings up so much valuable information. Um, by asking three short little questions, I can go from feeling like I'm an acquaintance, hi, I'm Laura, nice to meet you, to I'm your advocate. I know what's going on in your world. So let me throw, uh, throw to you guys three of the questions we love to ask in this section. So I like to say to the client, what does success look like to you? When you're done with this project, what will it take for you to say, working with ELB was a really good experience? You would be shocked at what you hear and the different types of answers that you hear from clients. For me as a project manager, if I know what success is like for them, I'm gonna drive them in that direction. Everybody has a different idea of success. If I know what theirs is, that's the direction that we're gonna go on and thus hopefully increase that customer delight. The second question I ask here, what is the most important objective that you are trying to achieve? Um, answers might be timeline. It has to be done in six weeks no matter what. Okay, that's great. Or you might have someone answer and say, it has to be perfect, it has to be engaging, it has to impress. It has to be immersive. I'm gonna take all the time that it needs to get it exactly the way I want it to be. Those are two very, very different objectives. And as a project manager, if I know what that objective is, I'm gonna drive a project in that direction. If someone is all about timeline, I'm not gonna pause and put the brakes on and say, hey, can we talk about a way to maybe enhance some things over in this area? not even going to bring it up it's not even on their radar they don't even care but if it's someone who wants to get it right is really obsessed with making it perfect i want to increase their delight by stopping and saying hey i got a recommendation for you i want to throw by you can i give you a call um two very very different ideas of what you know what the, the important objectives are so if we know those we can help them get there and then number three love this one what are you mostly concerned about this is where I can put on my little therapist hat and I hear ants responses to that that are all over the board. And most of the time what they're concerned about is something they don't need to worry about. I can make them feel better. Hey, you don't need to worry about that. Let me tell you why. Or, hey, this won't happen if we do this. Let's keep an eye on it. Um, a lot of times, you might even hear from folks, hey, I've got a boss who's breathing down my neck and I'm so worried if I don't get this done in time. It's really good to know that because then I can advocate for you and I can when I know if it worries you I can help you avoid what your what your anxiety is so just those three little questions on readiness give me so much knowledge to be able to help this client and move them forward all right so this is the next one agenda item number three and this is where we're going to touch on that animation question um, project scope so you guys see up on the screen, I got a little screenshot of a template of, of a statement of work that we use here at eLearning Brothers. Um, we try really, really hard to make those statement of works clear, concise, be well written. Um, but no matter how hard we try, do we still have confusion on what we're doing? Yes. <laughs> if you rely just on that statement of work, you will kick off a call and have confusion. Um, so let's talk about when, how I go through scope on readiness. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna clearly state, this is what I believe we are going to build for you. We're gonna build you a 30 minute storyline training course. And these are the tools that I'm gonna to build it with. I'm gonna use storyline, I'm gonna use beyond, 
whatever it is, this is what I'm building for you. And these are the tools that I'm going to use to build it. Does that sound right to you? This is how I'm going to QA it. Once it's built, this is how I'm going to check it. Our statement of works are so detailed that we even have it down to which browsers we're going to check the course in. There's so many browsers out there. We want to know, hey, what are you going to look at the course in? You're going to watch, look, at it and look at the course in Chrome? Awesome. We want to check it in Chrome. Um, this is where we catch a lot of things often right here. Hey, I didn't know that. We don't use Safari. Or somebody might say, oh, we're all Internet Explorer. That's when I can stop and say, hey, let me give you a little bit of advice about using Internet Explorer. It's actually not supported anymore. So if there's something that goes wrong, we can try really, really hard to fix it, but we can't guarantee that we can fix it. Are you okay with that risk? Are you okay moving forward with that? So by asking that question, if anything happens later on, we're kind of prepared for it. We know that it's going to happen. This is how it will function when it is finished. This is really big because remember Bob from accounting? He doesn't have that technical background. He doesn't have that training background. He doesn't get it. This is where I can keep it so simple. When you open it up, it's going to open up and you're going to view it on your desktop and you're going to hear audio. And when you get to the end of it or somewhere in the middle, there's going to be a test and it's going to be about 10 questions in length. This is how it's going to function. Um, the next line, this is how it's not going to function. I think we all know that there are people out there that think that when you build a course, it'll work on a phone, it'll work on a desktop, laptop, it's going to work on an iPad. That's not necessarily the case. I most recently did a readiness call with someone who thought that it would work everywhere, and she was disappointed when I had to tell her, we didn't scope to build this for a phone, for mobile. Well, can you just click a button and make it work? No, actually, we can't. Let me tell you why. Let me explain to you why. Designing for mobile, it's a little bit different. Mobiles are like this. Desktops are like this. <laughs> you got a lot less space. You have different proportions. We want to make sure that there are no disappointments at the very end. I would have just been heartbroken if we got to the end and she realized that it didn't work on phone and she thought that it would. So happy to capture that now and make sure she was okay with moving forward with that. Um, back to the animation. Um, the animation question this is a great time right here where we can make sure that we do have the lingo that's all the same my idea of animation might be different than your idea of animation that happens a lot with videos there's a really big difference between creating a video in beyond and it's sort of cartoon characters <clears throat> than if we do a live action shot on the set video um, production those are two very different things if we just say yeah we're going to make a video for you we might end up having some really different expectations when that video is made, what the end result is. So I really get down to what I call, you know, that elementary school level where I say this video is going to be a little cartoon with little cartoony people going across the screen to make sure that we're really, really clear of this is what we're building for you. This is the tools that we're going to use to build it. This is how we're going to check it. And when it's all done, this is how it's going to behave and this is where it's going to work. Um, I hope that answered that question about the terminology. If not, let me know. Okay, our next section of readiness, agenda item number four, project phases. I like to let clients know, this is how we're going to do this project. This is the steps. These are the steps we're going to go through. Oftentimes, I'll walk them through it. I'll say we're going to do a look and feel. We're going to do a storyboard. Then we're going to produce it. Then we're going to QA it. Usually there's no problems here. They've hired us for a reason. They know we know what we're doing. We can walk them through this. We can hold their hand and take them through the process. Usually we're good here. Where we get into trouble is actually what's gonna happen in each one of these phases. So this is where I might say, you have scoped in your timeline calls for you to get two reviews on each of these phases. Is that enough? Oftentimes, whoa, no, that's not enough. I need five or six reviews because I have 15 different groups that need to look at this. Well, I am so happy we talked about this right now because that's not what we were planning for. Thank goodness we didn't timeline for the two reviews and then we deliver it to you and find out you need three or four more weeks of review time. Timeline buster, budget buster. Let's plan for this now. 
Also, I like to remind clients, approval is required to move forward. It's required to get your approval before I move to the next phase. I will tell them a story about a client many, many years ago who we kept asking over and over to approve that storyboard. Um, she ghosted us. We didn't hear back from her. Um, she came back finally after five or six weeks and sent an email to us and asked, if, asked us if everything was finished. Are you all done? No, we're not all done. We've been waiting on you to approve that storyboard. And she was very upset because she had just assumed we were just cranking along. That's a really common problem that we face all the time. But now when we go through this in readiness, we can be really clear up front. If we don't hear from you, we're stopping. We need your approval to move forward. I always want to conclude project phases by saying, does this work for you and your team? I can have the greatest process in the universe, but if it doesn't work for the client, it's just gone. It's in the garbage. It doesn't even matter. Um, so it's so great to be able to say, does this work for you? Excellent. We have a plan and we're going to build the foundation of our project around this plan right here. So moving forward, we're confident that the plan that we've made, it's going to work. The next section we go through is contingency planning, all that boring project management stuff. But nonetheless, it's really super important. There are two things that happen all the time in projects. We talk about this common hiccups. The first one, a change order, also known as a change of scope. Do you know what that is? Do you know when we might need one? If we do need one, this is how it's going to happen. This is how it's going to work. The other, what does it mean if we're late? What does it mean to be late? Let's face it, we're always late. Everybody's late. Um, clients are always late. Life happens. We know at eLearning Brothers, we are not your number one priority. You are doing other things often, <laughs> and that's understandable. But how good that we're talking about this now versus when it happens, because more than likely it's going to happen. <laughs> so let's talk about it. If you're late, this is what it means. This is what I'm going to do with my team. This is what I'm going to do when you finally come back and say, sorry, I, you know, I slipped away for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. I'm back now. OK, this is how we're going to get things back on track. Really good to talk about it now to give the client all this education. So when it does happen, there's nothing unexpected. And they also have the tools in their belt to be able to make a decision on what they want to do to move forward. So contingency planning. All right, the next sections that we go through in readiness is we dive a bit deeper into each of the phases of our project. For the sake of time, I'm just going to put this all on one screen. But the first thing we talk about is look and feel. Hey, I'm going to have a graphic designer be on your kickoff call, and he is going to ask you a lot of questions about how you want this course to look. I want him to ask really pinpointed, good, educated questions to you. So I need to get in from you in advance any style guides, branding documents, images. Do you have all those? Can you send those over to us so we can get going? I don't want to get a graphic designer on the call and say, well, I haven't had a chance to look at all this yet, but once I do, I'll get back to you. No, that's not efficient. I also know with clients that sometimes getting these materials, these style guides and branding documents, Sometimes it's not as easy as them just grabbing them off the shelf, shelf and sending them over to me. Sometimes they have to request them from marketing. I've had clients who have to put it in writing and put in a request to give us access to be able to look at a style guide. These things take time. We don't want to wait till the day we're supposed to start this to start that process. Huge, very common hiccup in a project that will slow you down and put the brakes on your project. Let's start that now before we even kick off this project. Storyboarding, that's the next pop piece. I have that in bold on the screen because I will tell you storyboarding and getting content is the number one project staller. It's the number one cause of a big letdown on a, on a kickoff call, and it often is the longest piece of our readiness discussion. I need to confirm is the content that I have in my hands that you sent me, it's ABC123 underscore 567 dot PowerPoint. Is that the final file? 
You wouldn't believe sometimes what we hear. I think it's final. I don't remember what I sent you. Um, have we edited that since I sent that to you last? Let's let's check this. Let's check this now before we get on a kickoff call and confirm. At eLearning Brothers, we actually will not kick off a project without fully vetted and approved content from you. It's an absolute waste of time. You gotta have the content to start. It's the foundation. So in readiness, let's make sure we actually got it. We got what we need. Legals looked at it if they have to. Marketing's looked at it if they have to. And it is good to go. Then we do a section on development. We call it Tech Talk. This usually is a minute and a half. Um, if there's anything really special about a project technically, we'll stop and talk about it. I'm not a tech person. If there's something really, really techy that needs to happen, I want to know. So when we get on the kickoff call, I have the right person on that call. I can't answer those questions. I don't want to get on a kickoff call and not have the right people there. So if there's something really unique and I need to bring someone in, I know this and I can make sure they're on the kickoff call and we're prepared. It's also a spot to say, hey, do you have any videos, any assets, anything that you can be sending to me that you know you want us to use? Let's start collecting those now. I know development's not for a couple of weeks, but these things take time. Let's start working on it now. All right, the final agenda item for readiness is timeline. This is everyone's favorite part. Everyone wants to talk about timeline. I have to say that it is not good enough anymore just to say, when is it due? That will not work in this day and age. It just doesn't work. You have to dive deeper and ask more pinpointed questions when it comes to timeline. I like to start by talking to our clients about what it takes to build a timeline. I want them to know that it's not taking a Sharpie and just circling a date on a calendar. When I build a timeline, I've got to staff it. I got to make sure I got the folks available to do what we're promising that we're going to do. There's a lot of work that goes into building a timeline and I wanna make sure my client's aware of that. I like to ask the client, are there any days that I need to work around? Oh, I just now found out you're going to Hawaii for two weeks. Congratulations, that's awesome, I wish I could go with you. But does that mean you're not available to do any reviews or participate or be engaged? Really, well if so, we, we need to figure that out because that could, that could be a showstopper on your project. It could just stop us right in our right in the tracks. So we need to know any vacations, any conferences. Um, I've had clients that have told me that they've had a, a strict, strict deadline of December 31st, but they shut down two weeks into December. They just completely shut down. That's really important to know so we can plan for that. If they would have just told me December 31st and I didn't know that, we could have been looking at a really, really different end result for them. How much time do you need to review alpha and beta? Talked a little bit about that earlier, but our default at ELB is three days for alpha, two days for beta. Will that work for you? If they say that that won't work, that's okay. I can make that number and that day be anything that they want it to be. But if they say that they need two weeks for each of those reviews, I wanna make sure they're educated to know what that does to their timeline. If you need those two weeks, that's fine, but you're not going to hit that September 1st deadline. You're now looking at maybe the middle of October. It's, is that okay? Which one is more important to you, hitting that deadline or having those two weeks to review everything that we send you? Let's talk about this now instead of waiting until the first time I send you a deliverable. What is our due date? Our due date is very different than your due date. And I wanna be really clear with our clients on that. When you say that it's due September 1st, what does that mean? Um, is September 1st the day that I hand you the files or is September 1st the day that you go live? I have had clients that give me deadlines like of September 1st only to find out, well, actually, that means we really need it on August 15th because I have to pilot it and I have to test it and I got to get some user groups and feedback. That changes everything, right? I need to know what my due date is. My due date where I hand you off the files, you grab the baton and you take it and run with it. So again, make sure you clarify whose due date is whose and um, which what is my due date and what is your due date. So after you get all these constraints and have this conversation with the client, 
then you can talk about how does it impact your desired due date. Let them know up front. I think we're still okay, but we're really tight. And I'm going to give you a warning. If we get off a little bit, we're going to be at risk. Or maybe we're just absolutely way off now. That, you know, three weeks in Hawaii and the two weeks for the reviews and all of this stuff, you're, we're not going to make your deadline. What can we do? Can we get someone to cover for you while you're in Hawaii? Is there someone that you trust that can make decisions and make approvals? And who is that person? Um, what do we need to do to make this happen? Maybe we need to look at expediting this project. Maybe we need to hire some people to work some overtime, to work nights and weekends to make sure we get this developed for you and the time frame that you need. But again, these conversations need to happen now, not on kickoff when we're ready to start the project. So to conclude, I'll let you guys know at ELB, we love readiness. We have loved adding this phase, this one hour call to our project process. We have found that readiness has dramatically, dramatically decreased that big letdown on our kickoff calls. We hardly have those anymore. Whereas before, they were common. Um, they, they aren't happening as much because we're kind of doing that preemptive strike before the kickoff. We've decreased timeline killers, those common timeline killers of by collecting assets in advance. We're not waiting till the day of to get that video from you and then losing a day and a half because we can't find an FTP for you to get a big file over to us. So we've decreased our timeline killers. We've also decreased our kickoff call time. We in the past could have kickoff calls that literally lasted two and three hours. No one wants to be on a call for two or three hours. What we would find is the PM would be talking almost the entire time about all of the administrative stuff up front. And then all the people, the stakeholders, the experts, the instructional designers, the graphic designers that you worked so hard to get on that call had very, very little time to talk and to share and to give their expectations. So the experts who needed to do the talking weren't getting to do the talking. By talking through all of this planning and all this administrative stuff up front, the kickoff call time, we can kick it off, get going, and get right to the people that need to be talking and the people that need to be sharing. We've decreased hearing, I wish you would have warned me, or you should have told me, or one of my favorites is, you're the expert, you should have known this. We're not hearing that anymore because we talked about it. And I don't like to use the word warning because that sounds really negative. Um, but we did talk about it up front and we just don't hear that. And our clients don't feel that way anymore. They feel very well informed and very educated. From our clients, they have told us that readiness provides them a safe space. They love that one on one with me and the project manager to be able to maybe say, I have a boss that's really little overbearing and I'm nervous about it. They would never say that on a kickoff call, but saying it in readiness, safe space for them to be able to share that and for us to have that conversation and talk about ways that maybe we can prevent that from happening. They love readiness helps them identify risks that they've never considered. They love that it's prevented timeline and budget busters for them. Um, they've often told me that they feel confident after readiness. They say at the end of the call, they're excited to get going. They feel good about it. They might have had some anxiety, but they're really ready to roll. Um, and then the best one is they say that readiness makes them look good, makes them look like a rock star. They get on these project kickoff calls and they look good. They look like they've planned. We didn't hit any roadblocks or showstoppers. So the takeaway thought I'd love to give to you guys is what should your readiness look like? I have a quote over here from John Dewey um, that talks about, you know, we don't learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on that experience. So what should your readiness look like? Maybe it's not called readiness. Maybe it's not even a phone call. Um, but take some time to sit down and identify exactly what are those repeatable issues that you see over and over in projects. What are they? And how can we lower the risk of them happening? Because they are going to continue to happen. No matter who you're working with, they're going to happen. Don't ignore the past challenges and hiccups. Don't try to forget them and move on. Don't try to say, I'll get back to that later when I'm not quite as busy. Think about them, write them down, define them. Use those experiences to help yourself and to help others have more successful projects. Um, the last bullet, is to document if necessary. Um, when we go through readiness, I take notes. 
I write all of this stuff down. Um, thankfully, at eLearning Brothers, we don't have a culture of, look, I've documented it, I said so. Remember, we told you this. We, we really don't roll that way. Um, but I know there are organizations that documentation is really important to them. They, they do it a lot and they need it. Um, so having that documentation from readiness might be really helpful to you. It might be nice for you to say, hey, I documented during my readiness call that um, Lisa was, you, you told me Lisa could give me all the approvals and, and that's what we moved forward with. I, I have it right here. So if documentation is something super important to you, this might be a really, really good asset for you to have. So that is it. We've walked through readiness. I want to thank you guys for listening to me talk <laughs> for I don't know how many minutes. If you ever you know, become a client of eLearning Brothers, I would welcome the chance to get to have a readiness call with you, um, to strategize, to talk about what risks might be and, and ways that we can try to prevent those risks from happening, um, to prevent you from having any big letdowns in your project, and, and hopefully, as we say at ELB, you know, make you look like an e-learning rock star. So thank this you very great, much. Laura. Thank you yeah. so much. Do you have a couple minutes left, if you wouldn't mind taking a couple more questions that have come up towards sure. the end of the I try my um, best. Here's a great one that comes from lots of experience. How uh, do you have any guidance on finding hidden stakeholders? Uh, <laughs> I think that if I did, I would be a millionaire. Um, really, the only thing we can do is just have that really good conversation with the client on readiness, and we say, let's think hard about this. And then we try to kind of define for them what a stakeholder is. Is there anyone that has a stake in this project? Is there anyone who thinks this project is important? Um, is there anyone that's going to be using this training, using this course? Do they care what it ends up being? And just trying to dig, dig, dig and pick away at that and try to get that answer. Um, beyond that, yeah, I wish I had the magic wand to make them all appear and we could identify them. Um, right. But it's really, we just got to communicate and just talk talk about it and think really hard. Excellent. Now, you, you mentioned a little bit along this uh, line as it came to early meetings in the process, but um, what do you do, how do you respond when a client wants a an estimation of time, an estimation of cost, but is not ready to give you the content yet? Okay, so here's what we do at eLearning Brothers, because that is a big one. That's a huge one. And it used to be, a, that was a very common showstopper for us. We would start a project only to realize we scoped this for a 15 minute training and they just sent us over two hours worth of content. <laughs> That's a problem. That's a showstopper, right? So here's what we do. We have a rule, I, I hate the word rule, but we have our policy, I guess if you want to call it, and it's in our statements of work, that we will not start a project until we have your finalized content. Once we get that content from them, we have someone on staff who does what we call content ver verification. So we will send to her, here's all the content, this is what they send us. sent us, this is what they're saying is final, here's our scope and our statement of work, does it match? She will either come back and say, yep, we are good, this is exactly what we expected it to be, or she might come back and say, we're not good, and at that, case, in that rate, we will not kick off the project. If she says, nope, this doesn't match expectations, we get from her, well, what, what's going on? She might say, it's way too big. It's way bigger than what we thought it was. Okay, so then we can go back to the client and say, okay, we're not gonna kick off until we got this worked out. Here's your options. You can add some hours to the project and increase your instructional design time, and we will be happy to work with you to go through all this content, to cut it, help you figure out how to cut it down, help you figure out where to cut it down. Or if that's not good for you and, and maybe you don't have the budget for it, we're gonna ask you to do it. So we, we're gonna hand this content back to you. We want you to cut it down. When you're done, send it back, we'll repeat. We will rinse and repeat until our content verification person gives the thumbs up and says, yes, we're ready to go. We will not kick off a project without her thumbs up. It's just we've had too many big letdowns on kickoff calls where we think we have what we need and we don't. Sure. 
Excellent. Um, jumping to the other end of the spectrum, do you or other other end of the process? Do you have post postmortems or lessons learned, notes for the next cycle? Is that part of a part of our process? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that um, we're. I'm, I'm admitting that we've had periods of time where we've gotten busy and we haven't done it like we should. But yeah, we try to always internally have an internal closeout call with our team. And when we do, we will run the reports. Um, to show the, the hours that we worked on the project to be able to say, yeah, we came in under budget or yeah, we came in way over budget. Why? What happened? Did we scope it incorrectly? Um, did we maybe have someone on the job that wasn't as, as quick or maybe wasn't as strong of a, of a developer as we thought they were and it just took them a lot longer? We do try to dissect that down. Um, or maybe sometimes we find that, gosh, this client just needed a lot more than what we thought. So next time when they come around, we want to have those conversations with them about, hey, remember last time? What can we do to prevent that from happening again? Or maybe we need to add some hours to our project um, to shore that up. So we do do that internally. And then we also, we um, actually stopped this for a little bit. I hate admitting it, um, but we do also, oftentimes we'll call our clients and I, uh, it was me who was doing it, would walk them through a survey and ask them questions about their experience. And the questions were based on our mission statement to make sure that we actually do what we claim and want to do. Um, and we, uh, we take that data very, very seriously. Um, we add it up and we share the scores with the team. So yes. That's wonderful. Now there's a lot of questions here. I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them. We'll just we'll just grab Aww. one more here, and uh, <laughs> okay. I will send the offline questions to you afterwards, and we'll see if we can get those posted in the uh, the blog recap later in the week. But um, okay, sure. Uh, the last question we'll ask here is: Do you have a standard list of e-learning participants for the readiness meeting? A standard list of who needs to go to that? From our side, it's it's always me, a senior and lead project manager, and then I try to have the project manager who's going to be the day-to-day -day on that call. It's just the two of us. Now, I will say the sales rep sometimes will sit in and listen, um, So it's it, but it's really just that. We try to keep it small, try to keep it intimate, so it just feels like that safe space where we can talk about all the, maybe the bad stuff or the stuff we're worried about or our anxiety. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just me and the PM and, and maybe the salesperson. All right, great. Now I believe you have one more slide for me here. Um, what yeah. we would like to, to first of all, go. thank you everybody <laughs> for joining us. Thank you, Laura, for this excellent information. Uh, lots of great feedback here. People are, are going to use this information on their on their daily job so it's going to be very very cool. useful if you would great. like to request a jam session or have more information given to you about what e-learning brothers does you can email scott condy his email address is right there s condy at elearningbrothers.com if you would like to see more uh like demos of what e-learning brothers has done some other projects that laura's worked at worked on you can see that at elearningbrothers.com and then you can select custom in the navigation bar if you are a developer and developing on your own, we also have an awesome, uh, enormous template library for tools. We also have assets, cutout people, pretty much everything that you could need. So uh, you can try those out with a free trial right now as well, seven-day free trial. You can also find that at elearningbrothers.com. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Laura, for that information, and uh, we hope we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.